Now give yourselves a round of applause for clapping. <laughs> Yay! And for being here. I am Laura Flanders. I would love to welcome you to this, the first historic Future is Public Democratic Ownership of the Economy Conference for right now. <laughs> this conference has been many, many years in the making, as have many of the projects that we're going to be talking about today. It is co-convened by TNI, a 40-year-old advocacy and research organization that works for social justice and a democratic economy, and the 99 von Amsterdam, which is sort of the fearless city's working group of the Amsterdam municipal government. This conference is historic in many, many ways, as you'll hear. In the most startling way, I think, it is that it puts public in the title of our future. And I think we live in a time where li living in the public, with the public, is ever more difficult because of war and climate change and migration and deep inequality. More of us are living closer together with less. There is a right wing out there that seeks to capitalize on how difficult it is for many of us to get by and to encourage us to blame one another. But at this conference, like at my program, The Laura Flanders Show, we believe not only in reporting on what's going wrong in the world, but in really exploring what just might be going right and doing our best to change the public sense of possibility. So this conference, we hope, will change your sense of what is possible. What is possible in the basement of a garage, for example, and what could change in our future. Perhaps we could have the private cars below and the public meetings above. <laughs> we are very happy also to be in this particular neighborhood of Amsterdam, the Bilmir neighborhood, which has, I think, not received a conference quite like this before. But I want to start today by welcoming the chairperson of the executive board of Amsterdam Sudoist, this neighborhood, Tanya Jadnanasing. Tanya, welcome. This? Take this. Yes, use that microphone. It will be thought. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, I guess. Um, that you had never thought that you would be in a garage actually doing an international conference. I was just having my bicycle routine coming here and I was like, wow, will those people show up actually if they would read that they would have a conference in a garage and you all showed up. So thank you so much for that. <laughs> um, a warm welcome on behalf of 90,000 inhabitants of Amsterdam Southeast. We have 170 nationalities living here. So I think you would, should feel warm, a warm welcome because I saw in the program that there are people here from El Salvador, Nigeria, Chile, London, Barcelona, Asia. So this is just like Southeast because we all have all those nationalities in Amsterdam Southeast. We have a quite young population in Amsterdam Southeast, and um, I have to excuse myself because I, I will warmly welcome you, and then I will just run away, and that's because I have a meeting. I have a meeting at 10 with 12 young youngsters. They are 10, 11, and 12, because we have a children committee in Amsterdam Southeast, and they advise us on how to get um, our problems here solved because we do have we have nice stories in Amsterdam Southeast but we do have our challenges and I'm really happy that you are here to talk about uh, putting community first community above companies we do need those companies but we need our people even more so public first I'm quite delighted that you want to spend two days in an international group and then Two days, will Amsterdam will talk amongst 
themselves and I hope some of the international guests will stay and share their knowledge and their experiences with us because I do think that it's in these collaborations that we get our answers on all of those challenges we do face. And I want to share just two little stories. You know, I know I have only eight minutes to talk, so don't worry, Miss Laura, because I won't be long. Politicians tend to be long, but I'll be short. But I have two, sh two stories I want to steer, share with you. The first story is that um, when I became the chairman of this board, Actually, I do have to tell you, I am from a really, really privileged background. I have had all the opportunities life can give me. I have a dad who is uh, attorney at law, so um, I had all the things. So when I came here, I was like, okay, how will those people look at me? They're like, this really overprivileged lady who thinks she can be our chairman, whatever. And I was like, okay, then, you know, what I should do is I want, I have to let them know that I understand. And I have to let them know that I don't understand and that they can teach me. I think that one of the biggest challenges we do have to just cross the barriers is, um, I don't know f who is in the public at this moment, but are you all people who are academic? Who is academically yeah, you see, that's what, uh, me too, yeah. And it's, it's, it's really nice that we as academic people, we say, well, we, we want to help. We want to uh, give people a voice, it's wonderful. But then again, please, let us understand that we don't understand. So we have to invite, really invite people to sit next to us and even to teach us how things can be done. That's why I'm leaving in a couple of minutes to talk with my children. Because when I came into Amsterdam Saudis, I said, children first, wonderful. But if I say children first, are they really first? Then I should ask them to sit at my table and decide with me what we are going to do for the kids and with the kids. And I guess also if we are here to say, yeah, you know, power to the community, power to the public, great. But do we talk to the people we really want to serve? Because what is community actually? Actually, community is wanting to serve the other, wanting to serve the community. Community is coming together. But who is sitting at the table? Is it really the person who uh, we are saying we want to care about? Is that person sitting with us at the table? That's just a little thought. So I was, um, um, I could be the, the chairman here, and I went to a, um, house which is called Alacondre, all it's it's trans it's Surinamese and it would be translated as all nationalities, all people, Alacondre. And there was a meeting there and there was a young boy. I think he was like ten. He is from Ghana. And I walked up to him and I was like, Hello, I'm the new chair lady. What can I do for you? Because I asked this this question to all the adults and I asked him, What can I do to you for you? And a lot of you know this story, the people from Amsterdam know this story, but sorry, I'm going to tell it again. Um, and um, he looked up at me and I said, okay, so who are you? And I was like, Tanya, I'm Tanya, and I'm the chair lady of... And he said, okay, wonderful, but what does a chair lady actually do? And I told him and he said, okay, so you can do a little? I said, yeah, a little. And um, then he came up with this. He said, okay, I have one assignment for you. It was this really bright looking guy, 10 years old. And he said, please, can you just make sure that people don't call me poor anymore? Because you know, my mom and my dad, they don't have money. That doesn't make me poor. I'm full of talent, I'm full of possibilities, and I'm full of dreams. This is one of my inspirations to, to come every day come to my office and just thinking about that boy and thinking, yes, we should really change our own mindsets. How dare we call people poor? You know, it sucks the energy out of people. So that's one story. The other story is we have youngsters in the, in the room. I'm hearing somebody, a, a little baby. How wonderful. I love it. You, you should bring them young. 
Why are you taking them away? No, it's wonderful. You know, in Amsterdam, Southeast, we include everybody. Everybody is welcome. Babies are welcome, children, older people. So I love it. And he ma the man is standing there with his baby, bringing him out of my sight. I don't want that. Bring him, bring the baby to, s I want to see the baby. Yeah, this is inclusion. If, yeah, it's wonderful. And I'm a grandmother, so I love babies. I do love, but no, actually, this, I, I, I'm making a joke, but I mean this. I mean that, you know, if we are getting annoyed by a little boy just, you know, asking a little bit of attention, who are we? to say that we want to change Amsterdam or we want to change Europe if a little voice annoys us already. So, you know, what I think is, what I really want to leave with you all is um, I have a, a children voorzitter. This is called, it is the chairman of the children committee. And uh, well, actually I have a new one, but this is the, it's a story about the, the old one. Whitney, Whitney Pengel. And she said to me, and this is an inspiration I take with me all the time. She said to me that um, when people come to Amsterdam Southeast, you should really welcome them really warmly. Because people nowadays, and this is the children's vision, she said, people nowadays, they are so angry and they are so annoyed and they get so um, grumpy about all kinds of things and she was asking herself why because you know you can also count your blessings and I've learned from her that every day I should count my blessings three blessings every day write it in a journal every day three blessings and I'm doing this for a year now so one blessing is we're in a garage actually I think that this is I don't know is this for um, the first time in the whole of the world that there is a Conf international conference in the garage? Mike, you think so? I think so too, but I want to think so. Because then it's Amsterdam Southeast again, just, you know, setting the agenda. I love that. Uh, but then again, she said that you just ought to count your blessings. So the, this garage is one blessing. Another blessing is actually we're meeting with all great minds. <laughs> minds who really think alike. Wonderful. And the third blessing is that actually... Our community in Amsterdam Southeast, they prepared food for you. They organized all of this. You are having a conference in a garage, but you will also be in a mosque. You will also be warmly welcomed by this community of 170 nationalities. So I am so proud of them. And then, again, that warm welcome. I want to leave you with that warm welcome. And Angelica, can I ask you to come here? because she, I need your help. And I think this is also one of the great things. If we really want to serve community, then we should always ask help of our community. So this is Angelica. And Angelica, you know what a brasa is? Yeah. yeah, okay, you know what a brasa is. So the people, some of them don't know. And we'll teach them. You know, Whitney Pengel again, she said that when people come from across the whole of Holland and even from abroad, we should teach them this warm greeting. And the warm greeting is called a brasa. Can you say it? Brasa. Thank you so much, brasa. So we'll do it for you. Then you have to do it yourselves. It's quite intimate, but then again, well, we'll be here together with, uh, amongst us with, for two days. So better get acquainted. OK, so this is the brasa. Aww. Now you do it to your neighbor. Hey, Renata. <laughs> so a warm, warm, warm welcome to Amsterdam Southeast. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you, thank you. Um, we have a little bit of business to do, but before that, I want to invite our panelists for the first group of the discussion to take their chairs. Come on up this, uh, this way and take your chairs. Um, I think if you could sit in the order that you're going to speak, Eloy first, and then uh, Renata, and Sophie, Philip, and then David. Um, I also want to thank our hosts. This is uh, indeed a garage, but it is also a Pentecostal church. And I want to thank everybody from the church who has helped to bless the space. Their blessings are already in this air. And um, we are very honored to be here and to be working here with you. I also have a little bit of information about the headphones, but I don't know that information. 
So I will ask for help, as Tanya has suggested. This is Satoko. Can we hear it for Satoko, who has organized today's event? Tell me what to do. You can, yes, borrow a microphone. It'll be on. It is on. Good morning. Well, a little bit of our lack of capacity, so the, the, uh, the about this um, the translation, we have a professional translators. They mainly uh, making a translation from uh, uh, English into French and Spanish. We will we uh, we're happy to welcome Spanish and French speaking uh, colleagues. Only to, but this morning, the Anna Sophie is going to speak French. If you don't understand French, technically speaking, everybody has to have this. However, we have only 200 headset. So uh, from now, the TNI staff is distributing. The, if you, who needs who needs the, the equipment? Okay. So the now TNI staff is distributing to you. Just be attentive to get it. Okay. So then, uh, the, I'm sorry if you uh, the, if you don't you if we we hope we have enough. Okay. I bet we do. Things have a way of working out. Satoko Kishimoto, everybody. Thank you very much. So we begin with stories. We begin with specific stories from specific places. And we hear not from people who have dreams of how things might be, although we're in favor of dreams. We hear from people who are putting into effect alternative systems of governance of management, of policy. We're going to hear from the following speakers. I will introduce them all, and then I have asked each of them to give us some sense of what they are up against, what is the challenge they face where they live, and how they have taken on that challenge, with whom. And then we will have a little conversation on the panel about how we might best help one another, about what challenges remain, and how we could create critical mass from the kernels of experimentation and the examples that we're going to see on the stage today. So at the far end is Eloy Badia. He is Council of Climate Emergency and the Ecological Transition at the Barcelona City Council. Next to him, Renata Brauner. She is Special Representative of the City of Vienna. Next to her, Anne-Sophie Olmos who is a city councillor at the city of Grenoble in France, and then Philip Glanville, mayor, oh, not Glanville, what the hell with Glanville? Philip Glanville, mayor of London Borough of Hackney. <laughs> uh, David Dessers is deputy mayor of Leuven, is that right, in Belgium? That's right, yeah. So we have Belgium, Hackney, Grenoble, Vienna, and Barcelona represented on the table. Let's start with Barcelona. Eloy. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's fantastic to be here with all of us. And it's amazing that we are from around the world talking about the same topic. So we have, we are starting something or we, there are people that are fighting a lot of years and now we are here. For us now, the most important challenge at the moment, maybe for all of you, is the climate emergency. I understand that climate emergency have a lot of perspectives, not only environment, it's social, it's economical, it's a very uh, big issue. And we are thinking that now we need a new agreement like uh, Human Rights Universal Declaration. Now we need a new, a new agreement for uh, ecological issues and social issues. And we know that it's not easy because we are now we are thinking on Madrid that we are celebrating the COP and we are seeing what the states are saying, what is saying Brazil, United States, China, India, Russia. We know that it's uh, very complex, but we have to make uh, pressure on that. No? On, on that issue, one of the keys is energy. So maybe we want to talk more about energy. We know that it's one of the of the keys. We have to talk, to talk about decarbonization of the economy. And unfortunately, uh, Spain is not a good example. We know that in Spain, all the legislation on energy and electric sector was, was written by the big companies. We call the, the big five companies the oligopoly electrical, electrical oligopoly. And it's governed by revolving doors with all the former presidents in Spain. That is in the same way. They are one time in the presidency, after goes to these big companies. And it's just for, for protect their interest 
and we have to make this transition, energy transition for the sovereignty. We have to change from the a model based in the fuels that is uh, centralized, that is very polluted, and we want to advance for a democratic, that we want that all participate in this producer, all participate to decide what we want to consume, how we want to share with other people, what we want to do with our energy, so a democratic, decentralized, participatory process in energy. And to recover the idea of that energy is a public services, we know that in Spain we have 10% of the population that cannot access to energy, that we call uh, energy poverty, so we, we have to change that. And that's the idea to create Barcelona Energia, that it's a municipal company, 100% uh, public, and maybe we can talk more about Barcelona Energia in next interventions. What does it mean to be 100% public in Barcelona? Sorry? What does it mean to be 100% public in Barcelona? It's a metropolitan, it's from the municipality, not only Barcelona, uh, 36 municipalities in the metropolitan region, and it's all it's from the public, it's from the, from the municipalities, and to, to work together with the civil, civil society. Perfect. Renata, to you, also on the subject, that's right. Thank you very much for the invitation. My name is Renate Braun. As you said, I'm special representative of the city of Vienna. I'm special representative for public services and municipal companies. And I think this position shows uh, what we in Vienna think is important to solve uh, all the challenges of the future, social cohesion, climate change, all the problems we are facing. And we strictly believe that the answer can't be privatization, can't be a neoliberal answers, but should be publicly influenced uh, or publicly owned uh, companies in many of these fields. For example, also in Vienna, the energy company is 100% owned by the city. Uh, and uh, we believe that this is a very important uh, for example, to give you a very prominent example, uh, housing, which is uh, a very important question for the daily life of the people. Um, housing, for example, in Vienna is 60% um, of the Viennese live in uh, publicly subsidized or publicly owned uh, flats. We have 200,000 uh, uh, flats, uh, so-called Gemeindewohnungen, which means these are municipal flats. We have 200,000 uh, flats which are publicly subsidized, uh, so um, two-thirds of the Viennese are living in uh, one or another um, way uh, publicly uh, financed uh, flats. And when we discuss this in international conference, uh, I always look in astonished faces and the people say, what? Two-thirds of the Viennese are poor people? No, not at all. We believe that housing uh, is nothing for the so-called uh, private market, but housing is a social responsibility and a public responsibility, and therefore uh, we organize in the way, in the typical Viennese way. And uh, we have many discussions uh, with the conservatives. They always want to sell the energy company. They always want to force us to sell these publicly owned uh, houses and flats. But we refused, we refused uh, successfully. Uh, and because uh, the, the, what they say, you are influencing the so-called free market. Well, that's true. And that's exactly what we want to do, because we think it's a social responsibility and not a question of the free market. Uh, and this is one example. Maybe we have the chance to talk about other examples that in Vienna we think that uh, it's important that the society, uh, the social cohesion is in center of politics and not uh, the private sector. There is, a, of course, a cooperation, as uh, we heard before. Of course, we need companies and we support them. We are proud of this. But we think that uh, it's very important and that this is one of the reasons, this strong public sector, that uh, Vienna is ranked so often uh, in um, international surveys as the city with the highest quality of life. When you look after this, when you look at these criteria, many of them, good working infrastructure, public transport, very important. 60% of everything is organized in Vienna via public transport, so that's very important to, to face uh, and to work with the climate crisis. Um, and uh, nobody knows, or too, too, too few people know, that one of the reasons for these high rankings is the high and strong public sector in Vienna. Beautiful. So our challenge is to defend this, and I hope we have the chance to talk about this afterwards. We have a European citizen initiative 
for public housing, and I hope we have the chance to talk about this, because we need your help. Just to underscore, how many times has Vienna been in the top 10 of the cities with the highest quality of life for living? For the Mercer study, the 10th time in a row, and uh, we have many rankings, number one, and I don't share this with you. I mean, okay, I have to admit we are proud of it, but that's not the reason why I share it. The reason why I share it is to tell you and, and, and ask you to tell everybody else that the reason for these uh, high rankings is the good infrastructure, uh, waste management, public transport, health system, uh, education system, energy system, working energy system, all of these is publicly organized and publicly owned in Vienna. So it's not just the chocolate and the Watson. <laughs> well, maybe a little the chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's move on. Let's hear from Grenoble and Sophie Olmos. We'll be speaking in French. I will put on my headset. I encourage you to do likewise and listen in. And Sophie. Merci, bonjour à tous. Euh, Est-ce que ça marche okay. euh, Désolée parce que mon anglais est très très mauvais, donc je vais être obligée de parler en français. Euh, Qu'est-ce qu'il en est euh, donc, pardon, Je suis Anne-Sophie Olmos, donc conseillère municipale à Grenoble. C'est euh, une petite ville, 16e ville de France, euh, en termes de, de taille, de nombre d'habitants, 170 000 habitants. Et donc moi je suis la coprésidente du groupe majoritaire à la mairie, un groupe de 42 élus dans lequel euh, siège euh, Eric Piolle, notre maire de Grenoble. Qu'en est-il de la question de, de l'eau, de l'énergie et du logement à Grenoble euh, La question de l'eau, euh, ça a été une énorme question il y a 30 ans, euh, à cause d'un ancien maire de la ville qui, est, qui a été euh, condamné pour corruption. Euh, donc il y a 30 ans, on a mené tout un combat contre euh, ce maire et on a réussi à remunicipaliser l'eau de Grenoble dans les années 2000, et euh, ce nouveau modèle de remunicipalisation, on a, on a essayé de l'étendre à nos autres entreprises publiques dans le domaine de l'énergie et du logement social, et notamment en créant un comité des usagers. Si vous voulez, les, les habitants qui sont soulevés avec certains élus et la société civile et les salariés euh, contre cette corruption-là, on a fait en sorte qu'ils puissent continuer à accompagner la gestion de l'eau au plus près dans la gouvernance de notre entreprise. Et c'est ce modèle-là qu'on essaye de recopier aujourd'hui dans le domaine de l'énergie et du logement social. Euh, en ce qui concerne nos entreprises publiques euh, énergétiques, bah forcément, euh, l'enjeu le, aujourd'hui, c'est de répondre à la crise climatique, donc la sortie du nucléaire, mais aussi de lutter contre la précarité énergétique. Euh, on verra peut-être plus de, de solutions, de réponses euh, tout à l'heure. Et en ce qui concerne le logement social, il se passe quelque chose de très important et de très grave en France en ce moment. Depuis cette année, euh, le gouvernement de Macron essaye de casser le, les modèles de logement social. Donc il essaye d'arrêter tout ce qui est euh, 100% logement public. Il essaye de privatiser les biens communs. Et c'est là-dessus aujourd'hui qu'on travaille. On n'a pas encore trouvé toutes les réponses, mais on a un énorme défi à Grenoble et en France, c'est de pouvoir réinventer le modèle français du logement social. Donc si on a des réponses à partager, bien entendu, on est vraiment preneur. Et ensuite, en termes de contexte général, on a reçu une grosse vague d'austérité depuis ces six dernières années en France. Euh, le gouvernement macroniste essaye de paralyser les communes. Euh, il nous force à contractualiser nos, nos budgets. Donc on est vraiment paralysé financièrement. Il nous supprime la taxe d'habitation, donc ça peut être bien pour les habitants, mais derrière, ça veut dire quoi Ça veut dire que euh, les villes n'ont plus de ressources, en fait. Euh, donc, en fait, le gouvernement de Macron essaye de vraiment recentraliser euh, toute la politique et euh, paralyser les communes. Et en même temps, on a ce mouvement des Gilets jaunes, dont vous avez sûrement entendu parler, euh, qui euh, demande plus de pouvoir d'achat et donc d'avoir des entreprises publiques euh, en ce qui concerne les transports en commun, l'eau, l'énergie et le logement qui correspondent aux premiers postes de dépense des ménages. Ça nous permet à nous, villes, de trouver des solutions pour répondre à la demande des mouvements sociaux comme les Gilets jaunes. Merci bien. Next up, we have Philip Glanville, who is the mayor of the London Borough of Hackney. Philip, also give us some sense of Hackney and what you are up against and what you've done about it. Yeah, so sort of a first minute really picking up where Anna-Sophie left off. Um, 10 years of austerity imposed by central government. So Hackney's lost about 50% of its central government funding over the last 10 years. It's been through an immense amount of change. 
it's not too dissimilar in some senses in terms of demographic makeup to where we're sat now, but it's a bit close to the center of London. So it has some of the highest levels of child poverty in the country mixed with some of the highest rental and house prices anywhere in the UK. So our challenge at the end of the last recession was all of the models of delivering public housing had failed. Um, there was no longer proper central government grant for public housing, the market wasn't providing it, and housing associations were finding it harder and harder to make projects work. And there was a history in the UK of transferring public assets to those bodies to try and deliver public housing. And that had completely failed. And rather than sort of waiting it out, we decided that we were going to go back into delivering genuine public housing again directly. Um, and inspired a bit by the work that Vienna has sort of sustained and never withdrawn from, we've invested in new high quality architecture and some of the very best public housing in the UK. We've built around a thousand units. Um, just under half of those are genuinely affordable homes. And because of the absence of all the things I've just talked about, we've also had to build private homes to cross subsidize the public housing. But we've done that to a, a set of values, which means we build integrated communities, so no divided uh, playgrounds, no divided facilities. All of them end up back in public management, so we haven't privatized land through this uh, dialogue. We also have an in-house estate agency, so when we're selling homes, we don't do that crass rebranding of place that you get so often around the world where communities are redefined to sell them off. We do that in-house to make sure that we're selling to local Hackney residents. So we've really tried to engineer how do you deliver public housing in an era of austerity when you don't have uh, funding. I'm happy to talk about more, more about that. We're also going back to our roots uh, in responding to the climate crisis. Hackney and Shoreditch used to have their own energy plants when they were founded. That was a public good that people looked to their local authorities and through privatisation and actually nationalisation, those were centralised and taken away from us. So a bit like the experience in Barcelona, we're going back into setting up an energy company. And that's a generating company looking at our energy assets, whether it's roofs, whether it's combined to heat and power plants, whether it's looking at how we have a just transition around providing the energy infrastructure for zero emissions at tailpipe. We want to be in the business of providing that as a local authority to make sure those public goods are owned firmly for the community and shaped by the community that we represent. Uh, I think social inclusion is critical. You know, the type of place that I've described where you've got vast economic growth, uh, real challenges around how that's distributed, making sure that we also respond to that kind of market failure there, and also national leadership failure. Anyone that will be familiar with the British context knows that Brexit has now dominated national politics. It's local authorities like Hackney, like Islington, like Preston, that are stepping into that and, and making sure that whether it's around social exclusion, health, climate change, housing, that we're re reacting and delivering for our people. Thank you. Finally, David. Yeah, uh, good morning, everybody. My name is David. Uh, I'm from Leuven, Flanders, Belgium. Uh, since the beginning of this year, there was a progressive coalition, coalition local government in, uh, in Leuven, while Flanders is going very much to the right. Uh, Leuven voted very much to the left, so that's very good. And so we are, um, for one year, busy now with this uh, local government. Uh, me, myself, I'm uh, the deputy mayor responsible for mobility, but also energy uh, sustainability. And I want to tell you something about energy. Energy in our country, uh, the um, liberalization of the energy sector in 2003 was a complete failure in Belgium. Um, the ex-monopolist, private monopolist, Electra Bell, stayed the monopolist after the liberalization. They own the seven nuclear, in, nuclear installations of, uh, of Belgium, and they were bought by Engie, the uh, multinational, uh, French multinational. And so the result of this is that uh, in Belgium, if you look to the energy mix, 87% of the energy is... <coughs> Uh, nuclear or fossil. So the renewable energy is uh, really, really not going fast enough. We see that there is no energy democracy. There, we are very dependent on the big companies. Uh, we also see that prices are very high and thousands of people are dropped by their energy company, etc. So what we try to do from a local level is to build an alternative. We want to build an alternative and we want to do it in a democratic way. So in our policy agreement we said 
that a renewable energy project should be common goods. And so that's what we are building at the moment, so local energy company, but in a cooperative way with participation of the population. We are trying to do uh, all kinds of projects uh, on renewable energy, solar panels, windmills, heating networks, and also other forms of, uh, of alternative interest. Uh, and uh, we started with this, and yeah, I can tell maybe later on more, um, because I see my time is almost over. But we started with this, we created an alliance around renewable energy, uh, with a very strong cooperative structure and now in the last weeks a new uh, local energy company uh, was born. It is called ECOP and it is a cooperative company, a collaboration of the local government with the population and that's the way we want it. Perfect, thank you. I just want to clarify why you said that Leuven Flanders was going to the right. This Flanders is not going to the right. just want to be clear. Um, <laughs> Leuven's going to the left. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. To hear, I don't know about you, but to hear the, the achievements here, um, one's mind spins a little bit. Because we all have lived with 30 years of governments and international institutions and multinational corporations telling us that the private way was cheaper and better and would provide the social services and public um, resources that we need. My question to you is what changed? to make these sorts of initiatives possible. Because I'm not hearing any quieter voices from private industry or from big corporations. The pressure, it seems to me, is still as great as ever. And yet, as the research from TNI has shown, around the world, your initiatives are not unique. Uh, when the TNI organization published its first report on Remunicipalization or municipalization, putting things back into public hands. They documented in 2017 800 such initiatives around the world. In the current edition of the report, which I believe is available in the back, they have documented over 1,400 such initiatives in 58 countries. So, my question to you is what shifted? Was there some kind of magic dust that fell on your communities? Or what did the financial crash? Um, what? Eloy, you want to begin? No, I think that maybe it's more easy. We have a, a, a political volunteer. Uh, if we want to make it, we can make it. But it's true that it's, it's not easy. Political uh, will. A political will, yeah, for sure. Uh, it's not easy because we have, uh, in the other side, we are all the time in the tribunals. Uh, for example, on, on we are working on water, we are trying to make to remunicipalization. Just so easy issues like uh, make the tariff lower, we have more than 20 uh, uh, demands on the tribunals. And, court, and to, uh, to, to the court, yeah, and two criminal uh, to the court for the uh, workers, public workers. So to the other side, they are working hard <laughs> to make that is not possible. They are trying to change the laws, they are trying to make pressure to the European Commission. But I think that we have the legitimacy of the, of the people. Uh, when we make an interview to the people to say, well, do you want the water was managed by public uh, sector? 80% say yes. But 80% in my region, in Catalonia, it's private. Then what's happened? 80% wants a public management, but 80% it's private. No? So we have to change that. And I have the, we have the power in this room. There are a lot of power, and we have a future to, to, to succeed. And, and Sophie, do you want to respond to this question? What changed? What made the remunicipalizations that you mentioned of water and energy possible? Alors pour l'eau, c'est euh, assez facile, j'ai envie de dire, parce qu'on a eu une crise énorme avec euh, la, la corruption, comme je l'ai expliqué tout à l'heure. Euh, C'était il y a 30 ans. Euh, et s'il fallait dire qu'il y a eu un point de départ au néo-municipalisme à Grenoble, je pense que c'est ça. Euh, cette lutte contre la corruption, elle a vraiment lancé un terreau euh, municipaliste à Grenoble, en tout cas relancé. Euh, c'est vraiment ça qui a donné envie, euh, quand on a vu que élus euh, d'opposition, euh, société civile et salariés euh, de la société de l'eau euh, se, se mettaient tous ensemble dans un combat commun pour euh, sauver le bien commun, je pense que ça a vraiment donné envie de continuer Euh, dans les autres euh, sociétés publiques et pour euh, le combat de la remunicipalisation des autres entreprises publiques locales. Euh, en plus de ça, je pense qu'aujourd'hui, 
Et là, je fais un bon, je, on n'est plus il y a 30 ans, mais vraiment euh, depuis euh, ces deux dernières années, je pense qu'on a gagné la, la, la majorité culturelle, en fait. Je pense que cette volonté de justice sociale et environnementale, on n'a plus besoin de l'argumenter. Aujourd'hui, elle est là. À Grenoble, on a le mouvement des Gilets jaunes et le mouvement des marcheurs pour le climat qui se rejoignent. Il y a une convergence des luttes et je pense que cette majorité culturelle, elle est là. Et une fois que les gens sont entraînés à la démocratie, les habitants sont entraînés à la démocratie, et au commun avec l'institution, quand l'institution a la bonne posture de facilitateur et d'accélérateur de ces mouvements de la société civile, je pense qu'en fait, les gens ils sont conscients qu'il faut l'autonomie des individus comme celle des territoires. Je pense qu'on vit là, en ce moment. So I'm hearing political will, legal fight, climate change, new movement alliances. Let me bring you into this, Renata. You wanted to add to this picture of why now are these changes possible in Vienna? Well, I agree with everything which was said, especially with the political will, because we in Vienna had very strong political will in the big tradition of the so-called Red Vienna of the 20s and 30s of the last century. Um, I agree with everything, but I want to add one very important, very simple thing. Privatization didn't work. Yes. Uh, we also did a, a study about remunicipalization in Europe with 700 examples from 20 countries. Everybody was interested in it. Um, I love to uh, invite you to share our website. I have the information with me. Uh, and, and it didn't work. Prices became higher, quality became lower. The private made their profit and they people they had nothing, it was bad for the people. So I think it's a very simple answer and therefore I think there are two, two things we have to do. The one thing is to mobilize the people, to inform them, to mobilize them, uh, that they participate and that they make the correct political decisions. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, and that's something we do together with all the cities which are represented here, we have to give the cities uh, a stronger voice in the European Union because the European Union has a construction problem. You have the, 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 the level of the nationalities, but you don't have the level of the cities. Two thirds of the Europeans are living in cities. And we have our special um, challenges and our special situation. We need to have a sector to solve it. And they build it houses and houses and houses, but they were all very, very expensive. And so it attracted very rich people to our city. And the effect was it only became Uh, more expensive and more expensive. And so after a while, you s just see that it doesn't work and that you need more public initiative, more initiative on the side of the offer, creating other houses, other prices, etc. But that you can only do by somehow building a wall between the private market and the public market. And that's, I think, what we have to do at the moment. And we are trying to do it in our city, for example, with more public houses. Uh, it is absolutely needed. Also, a stronger uh, renting market because in um, in Belgium there is a many people. You know, the, there is a, lot, a big focus on ownership of houses. So I think it is important to have also a good renting market. And for example, in our city, we are also launching now a community land trust. So collective ownership of the ground, private ownership of the house. And that's also a new model, but with a wall between the community land trust and the private market, in order that a house that is sold today as an affordable house will stay an affordable house also next time when it will be sold. Because that was the tragedy on the private housing market. You can create a house, an affordable house, but once it is on the market, it becomes an expensive house. And that is what we have to avoid. Um, I have one just my question for you, Philip, to just elaborate slightly on the moment in which we find ourselves. Um, you did mention the dread word Brexit, uh, and it is difficult for me not to ask you about this moment in the UK specifically and the role that social cohesion or lack of cohesion or people being put at each other's throats is playing in Hackney and how you were able specifically to address that, those, those racial, gender, class, other tensions? That wasn't quite the question I thought I was going to be answering, but I'll try, try, to, keep, I'll try to keep you on your toes. I'll try, I'll try and do that. Just, just to say the pendulum in Hackney is not just swung. I think it's really important to say that we detected the same failure of the market uh, 
I would say in the mid noughties all of the orthodoxy, the only way you can improve public services was working with the private sector. It's very apparent when your municipality almost goes bust, it doesn't work. And so we've been insourcing and remunicipalizing for about 13, 14 years. Does everybody know what insourcing means? Can you just elaborate on so, what you mean? Uh, I, I was going to talk about the humble bin. Um, all of us as politicians, if we do not keep the streets clean, will be voted out of office. Mm. But that isn't the only social contract with collecting the rubbish, because you can collect the rubbish with a private business, or you can do it as a municipality. And for me, I think you can see what the market failure is often. You overpay to collect the bin, it's not done as well, and the workers are exploited. Or you can insource it, have a high quality service, workers are paid well, but then you can also innovate. You don't have to negotiate to innovate. So if you want to expand into food recycling, you can do that because you have an in-source service. If you want to switch the fleet to carbon neutral vehicles, you can do that without trying to change the contract halfway through if you've got a 10, 20, 30 year contract. You can employ local people. You know, you can do all of those sorts of things. So something that is very at the heart of what local government does, keeping the streets clean, can either be done privately or it can be done publicly. And what is interesting is if you start down that journey, the conservative parts of your organisation, legal, finance, the people that will wander, uh, uh, it's really risky to take on that workforce and to take on that risk. They get convinced because it starts saving money, because that profit is not leaching out into the private sector. So for me, I think there's a values driven piece, but it was market failure. And it was also how you prove to those conservative parts of the organisation that this works. And then you can go on into, we now have 50% of the commercial waste contracts in Hackney and make money out of them. So it's not Biffa, it's not Suez, it's not um, Veolia, it's Hackney Council serving Amazon headquarters on City Fringe. Um, no, because so not private good, companies, but the city, but the city, the city owned city waste it. management. The city does it. So on the Brexit question, I'm under no illusions parts of Hackney feel as left behind as the places that voted Brexit. Before I became mayor, I represented someone on the city fringe called Hoxton, 70% social housing. And day in, day out during that Brexit referendum, you're unpicking the lies of the Leave campaign. And all of the social tensions of where will my children live, these people are taking my jobs, all of that was at play on those doorsteps. So while Hackney voted 78% remain, and I wear my badge proudly, and I'm definitely a person that wants a people's vote, and I want to remain in the European Union. Healing those wounds and having a more inclusive economy, both in Hackney and beyond, has to be at the heart of why, you know, I would argue in an election period, a Labour government or something close to it is so vital. Because it's economic inequality being exploited by the right that's fundamentally fueled Brexit, and the economic model no longer working. You know, I'm very lucky, I've got a booming economy in a sense that all of the shops in Hackney are full. A shop closes, another shop opens. The high streets of Britain are not like that. And I think that dislocation, the extractive economy, and I'm sure that's going to come up in the next session, is what fueled Brexit and we have to respond to. Well, I might stick with you for a second, Philip, um, because one of our next questions has to do with what happens next. How do these initiatives get bigger than simply isolated cities of unique examples and instead become uh, or gain enough critical mass to affect nations. Uh, and the UK is in a situation where at least one of the parties is talking about nationalizing uh, industries at, at a very, or services at a very um, national, at a national scale. So two questions. One, how do you gain that critical mass? Do you feel you're doing it? And secondly, particularly in the, in the countries that have a history of public ownership, how do you overcome some of the stereotypes, some of the the um, images people have of public ownership in the past that wasn't always so positive? Well, I think the proof is in the services we, you know, we, we wouldn't have those contracts with private organisations if we weren't providing a high quality service. So there's nothing about, I think this is the, the false orthodoxy that private is somehow more efficient and better. And you, um, you talked to David about monopolies. The big debate in Britain, I think, is around renationalizing things like the um, broadband, BT, um, open reach. The interesting point about that was how many frustrated customers there were across the UK, whether it was rurally excluded digital customers or businesses in central London unable to get fast broadband to expand. 
There was a sort of unity that actually privatised monopolies or close to private monopolies are actually behaving as badly as perhaps some of the more lethargic um, nationalised industries did in the 70s and 80s, although I think you know, they're, they're held up as straw, straw people uh, in some ways. So, but I, the peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, all the experiences of us on the stage, all the conversations that are going to be happening today, I think show that when people go back to their communities, that asking the question and saying, can we do this, and then showing places that have. Um, I've appeared on a panel um, previously where I, I said, I was told I could not bring cleaning services in-house because it would be too expensive. You unpick it, and you unpick it again, and you unpick it again, and then you find out actually it's a tenth of the cost to bring it back in-house than was first presented because we, because we kept on asking the mm. questions. And then I think it, so in some ways, I, you know, I want a national Labour government, but we will continue this agenda even if we don't get one. And I think that's the power of grounding it in communities and municipalities, that that national pendulum you know, most of us, I think, uh, are in countries that are dominated by right-wing governments, and we're still able to deliver this. If we had a left-wing government, we could do so much more. Well, Lloyd, do you want to come in on this question of how to gain critical mass and, and how to survive <coughs> in a period of challenge? Barcelona has certainly been in a period of challenge. One is uh, we have to be connected and we have to share initiatives like this book that we can say that that, that is happened and that you have solution and we have to explain the, the, the good result the good result the good outcomes no, that is it's going on and I think the, the cha we are changing the minding of the people I think that I feel that there is something that is changed that people don't accept that we make a privatization in August uh, nobody talk about that it's not in any uh, electoral program people want to participate about that. And I think that this crisis, uh, climate crisis, is an opportunity. We have now we are talking about the commons. Uh, which are the common goods? Which are the common uh, the communities? Who and which are about the governments? Who have what? These governance of the commons, the water, the energy. Uh, which are the principles, the ethic, the values of this governance? No. And I think that uh, the point of view of the civil society, the point of view of the public, uh, have a, a strong role on that. And we talk about mobility, we talk about food, we talk about energy, water, our green. Now we are thinking about which is the future of the planet and which is the future of the cities and all the people. And I think it's a big opportunity to make a step. At, but we need um, we need pressure. We need uh, we need to be on with Friday for Future. We need to be in the streets, and we will need to be in the city in the councils and in the in, we need to change the law. And we have to make more ambitious that we need to change the law and we need to make a new framework for the future. I have to ask, as a member of the media that tries to cover this world um, and finds myself very often alone, um, is the media on your side? So many of you have talked about the importance of revealing facts, of revealing corruption, of articulating a public voice, of communicating a message. Do you have media, television stations, channels, radio? It uh, depends on the topic. For climate change now, yes, and unless in Spain uh, the media is talking about they are not talking who are the, the responsibility of that. They are only talking, talking about the problems that we will have in the future. No? And nobody talks about which are the companies that are pollution, which are the laws that are not permitted. But we can help that because the mentality of the people is changing. And now we have to focus who are the responsibilities of that and we are, which are the, the, the solutions and what we have to change. Uh, because it's the future of, our, of the future generations. Beautiful. And let's get a response from Renata and Sophie and David. Well, I agree that, uh, with you that uh, the, the climate crisis we have uh, is a, a chance. Uh, but I also agree that uh, concerning the question of media and on which side uh, the majority of the media, that media doesn't exist, like that politics don't, don't exist. It's, uh, they, <coughs> fortunately, there are positive examples. Um, but uh, they don't uh, are with us. They are not with us when you go to the to the roots of the problem. Uh, and I think that's why a conference like this is so important. And networking is so important because in Austria, and I think it's not so a big difference to other countries. When you read the newspapers, you think, as you said, private is wonderful, efficient, perfect, and the state is only a burden, high taxes and uh, they, they um, for nothing than bureaucratic uh, problems. And that's not true. But the reality is different. 
And therefore, it's so important to spread the information, to spread studies like we all have, and information that there are positive examples and negative examples of, of, of uh, privatization. And I think the most important thing is to mobilize the people, to inform and mobilize the people. And I don't have the chance to talk afterwards about our initiative, because uh, this European uh, Citizen Initiative for Social Housing uh, which is also an initiative against austerity, is very, very important. And we have an information stand on the backside, and we need all your networks because we have to have one million signatures until March. Then the European Parliament has to talk about uh, our initiatives for social housing, for non-profit uh, organizations for housing. I all think right. it's very, very important. So Renata will be at the back with her petition, and she needs signatures, among right. other things. And we'll get more information. And your network. And Sophie. Merci. Euh, comment on arrive à une masse critique euh, Je pense que dans les villes, on arrive à, à faire la preuve du concept. Je pense qu'on a réussi à redonner du sens. Là où le privé euh, est sur une notion d'économie euh, néolibérale à l'ancienne, il me semble que nous, dans le public, on a réussi à redonner ce sens à, à l'économie. Nous, acteurs publics, on doit arriver à se considérer comme euh, un vrai acteur économique au service de son territoire. Et quand on parle de réencastrer l'économie au service de la société, ça veut dire qu'en fait, l'économie, elle est juste au service de cette écologie politique, c'est-à-dire environnementale et sociale en même temps. Et en fait, je pense que c'est comme ça qu'on arrive à faire la preuve que ça fonctionne. Et aujourd'hui, ce n'est pas seulement le privé qu'il faut combattre, je pense aussi à certains États. Euh, hier, je parlais avec un Chilien. Quand on voit euh, la puissance de la révolution, bah oui, il y a beaucoup de violence, mais en même temps, il y a tellement d'espoir. Donc c'est pas que le privé, c'est aussi certains états et toute la violence qui va avec. Et je pense que c'est ici, au, au cœur de nos communes, euh, qu'on a réussi à relever les enjeux de notre siècle. C'est vraiment ici qu'il y a les, les solutions, on a un temps d'avance. Euh, le pouvoir, c'est les villes qui l'ont aujourd'hui. Et je pense que ce réseau translocal auquel travaille TNI, euh, euh, c'est Barcelone qui a relancé les Fearless Cities en 2017. Je pense que c'est grâce à Barcelone qu'on a réussi à redonner cette dimension internationaliste au municipalisme. Merci pour ça, merci à Amsterdam de nous accueillir aujourd'hui, merci à TNI, au 99 d'Amsterdam. Je pense que c'est vraiment là-dessus qu'il faut s'appuyer, aux députés européens qui, euh, l'année dernière, nous ont invités à Bruxelles pour remunicipaliser euh, l'Europe. C'est toutes ces démarches-là qui vont faire qu'on euh, arrive à vraiment se repositionner, nous, ville, au cœur du système, À Grenoble, quand on construit une école, on pense à, aux toitures végétalisées, au cours d'école dégenrées, on pense à la qualité de l'air, à la qualité des fournitures scolaires, au bio et local dans les cantines, on est à plus de 50%, et euh, au prix du repas, qui est à moins d'un euro pour les, les ménages les plus précaires. Et c'est comme ça qu'on réencastre l'économie, qu'on la remet vraiment au service des gens, et c'est ça qui va faire qu'on arrive à une masse critique, mmh. le pouvoir des villes. All right. Final thought from David. Yes, um, I think it's already mentioned, but it's very important today uh, that we fight against, let's say, neoliberal dogmas. Because for a whole generation of politicians, at least in my country, the neoliberal solutions were seen as common sense, as normal solutions. They were even not questioned. And I think it is important that we do that. And also the small initiatives on local levels, it is a starting point of creating other politics, creating another way of thinking politics. And I think that is very important. And I do believe that it is possible to bring it to another scale. For example, um, in Belgium two years ago, we have the energy distribution network in Belgium, and it is owned by the local municipality. So it is a public distribution network, not always man uh, managed in a very good way, but anyway, it is public. At a certain moment, they needed money uh, to develop smart grids and blah, blah, blah. And so they wanted to sell a part of that distribution network to a Chinese multinational company. And there was a very good campaign from the civil society, NGOs, trade unions uh, in, in Belgium. And uh, we were ordered, we, it, it, it was a success and um, uh, we uh, succeeded to stop this privatization. So it stayed public. You know, on the symbolic level, it was a very important struggle because it was for the first time since a very long time that we stopped the privatization of a national 
energy network. Mm -hmm. So that's a good example. A second example, maybe from our country, last, last week, okay, last week, uh, a new bank was born in Belgium. It was an initiative taken after the financial crisis. The name is New B, and it is a cooper cooperative bank. So another bank, uh, not a bad bank, as we say, but a good bank, uh, the only good bank probably, and they needed 30 million euros in a very short time to launch that new bank, and it succeeded. So in two weeks, I think, they found 30 million euros in the civil society uh, to launch that bank. And that shows, I think, that there is a great demand of alternatives, and so we need to bring it to that other scale, but it's not easy. All right, thank you all. We have for each of you, as you leave the stage, a gift from 99 Van Amsterdam. I believe in here you will find seeds. You are all seeds of change. Thank you so much for being with us. David Dessers, <laughs> Philip Glanville, Anthony Olmo, Renata Browner, and Eloy Badia. Come out this way and I'll give you your packet. Don't go anywhere, anybody. We have a whole nother panel of seed makers, seed planters. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And don't forget Renata in the back of the room with her signatures. Will the next panel please come up? Thank you. Thank you. Mind the stairs. Yes. Yes. So let's bring up Asma. Come up. Uh, you want to come this way? This fine. Jean. Ready. Rodrigo. Over there. Up. Oh. It's okay. It's okay. Oh, uh, could you swap with Rodrigo? With Rodrigo, oh. Freddie and Rodrigo swap. Jill, where is she? Two minutes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No? Yeah. Okay. All right. We have an announcement. We are very excited about our panelists and. Um, We'll continue the conversation. If before, don't forget, we're hearing from people that don't just have dreams and schemes. As somebody once said to me, I don't want to hear your dreams and your schemes. I just want to know what you can pay. Um, we're not going to hear from people who have just dreams and schemes. We're hearing from people who are making change where they live. And again, we're hearing from people who have positions in government where they live or very close to government where we live where they live. We were hoping that the mayor of Ricoleta in the Santiago metropolitan region of Chile would be able to join us, Daniel Jadue. You'll find his name in the um, program. Because of what's happening in Chile, that is not possible. But we have instead, and we are very excited to have with us, Rodrigo Hurtado Osbar, who is the executive director of the Open University of Ricoleta, about which you will hear more in a moment. So, to introduce all of our wonderful panelists, nearest to me, Asma Sheikh. She is city councillor from the London Borough of Islington. Next to Asma, uh, well, kind of next to Asma, where we'll go here. Next to Asma, Freddie Bailey, city councillor from the city of Preston in the UK, not so far from Manchester. Next to Freddie is, Rod is um, Rodrigo, who we have just identified, Rodrigo. Utardo Ospar from Recoleta, and finally Gilles Perrault, who is about moins soft to right now. Gilles, I'm going to ask you to begin. Tell us a little about your town, what makes what you have done so special, and what was the problem you were trying to solve? <laughs> Oui, bonjour à tous. Alors, Mansartou, alors si Grenoble est une petite ville, Mansartou est un petit village de 10 000 habitants dans, dans, dans le sud de la France. Et en fait, euh, on, on a pris conscience en, en 1998, lors de la crise de la vache folle, qu'il euh, fallait se saisir de l'enjeu d'une alimentation de, de qualité. Euh, en France, les, les municipalités sont responsables des, des cantines scolaires. Et euh, pour réagir à, à cette mauvaise agriculture et à cette alimentation qui peut nous, nous empoisonner par un mode de production euh, trop chimique et non respectueux de, de l'environnement et de la santé, 
nous avons décidé d'aller vers une restauration scolaire 100% bio, ce que nous avons réussi euh, de, le 1er janvier 2012. Donc tous les jours, nous servons à Montsartou 1200 repas 100% bio aux enfants des, des écoles. Mais s'est posé ensuite l'enjeu de la production, de l'alimentation de ces, ces cantines. Et devant l'absence de réponse euh, locale, nous avons créé, décidé de créer une ferme municipale qui produit des légumes bio que mangent les enfants chaque jour à la cantine. Donc on voit que euh, lorsqu'il y a un problème, la réponse municipale, la réponse du service public est, est possible. Devant l'engouement des parents euh, sur cette cantine scolaire 100% bio, on, on a fait une enquête et on, on a découvert que 87% des parents avaient modifié leur pratique alimentaire en mangeant plus bio, plus local, chaque jour à la maison. Et donc, on, on a lancé une maison d'éducation à l'alimentation durable pour accompagner ce dispositif. Maison d'éducation à l'alimentation durable, qui est un vrai service public de l'alimentation, euh, qui veut relever le défi de la production euh, alimentaire bio et locale qui respecte la, la santé et, et l'environnement. Si on a eu l'idée d'un service public de l'alimentation, c'est parce que depuis 40 ans, la ville de Montsartou a tous ses services publics en régie, c'est-à-dire en gestion euh, municipale, que ce soit l'eau, les pompes funèbres, les transports, les travaux, la cantine, etc. Et voilà, je m'arrêterai puisque j'ai plus de temps. <rire> so, Gilles, just to clarify, if we were to come to your village, Montsartou, we would find a publicly owned farm oui, tout à fait. 6 hectares de production de, de légumes avec trois employés de la ville, des agriculteurs salariés de la commune, qui produisent les légumes que mangent les enfants chaque jour. Who else has an urban farm publicly owned in their town that supplies the schools? Ok, just saying. Rodrigo. Talk a little bit about the university that you work with, which as I understand it is the first municipal university in Chile and is not so very old. Así es, eh, recién hemos cumplido un año de existencia. Se trata de una iniciativa más impulsada por el gobierno comunista de la comuna de Recoleta que se ha caracterizado por eh, desarrollar un conjunto de innovaciones que procuran eh, contrarrestar desde una lógica contrahegemónica eh, las políticas neoliberales que, debemos recordar, por desgracia nacieron en mi país y quizás no fueron tan lejos en ningún otro eh, lugar del mundo. En particular, la Universidad Abierta de Recoleta eh, se agrega a la gran lista de realizaciones del gobierno local eh, como la farmacia popular, las inmobiliarias populares, un centro audiológico, eh, librerías populares, etcétera, que como ya les decía procuran eh, ofrecer oportunidades por fuera del mercado a una población local que está constituida por alrededor de 170.000 personas con un porcentaje importante de población migrante, que es un dato histórico en el caso de Recoleta, y no solo reciente como sucede en el resto del país. La Universidad Abierta de Recoleta efectivamente es la primera universidad asentada en un municipio en Chile y procura eh, democratizar el acceso al conocimiento. Eh, en nuestro primer año de funcionamiento eh, ya tenemos 7.000 estudiantes en el primer y segundo semestres, en alrededor de en un total de 250 cursos que abarcan las más diversas materias, cierto, nuestra oferta de cursos a distancia, eh, que abordan una serie de cuestiones relevantes para la coyuntura política por la que está atravesando el país, Uno de ellos precisamente aborda las cuestiones relativas a la elaboración de una nueva constitución, que es quizás la demanda central de la rebelión popular que estalló en Chile el 18 de octubre. Mm. Two questions for you, Rodrigo. One is you talked about neoliberalism being born in your country. I felt a little competition because we like in the U.S. to think that it was born in, in Chicago. Um, we don't like to think about it at all, but um, when you compare your situation now with what was before, 
what is the difference? What has changed? It should be obvious, but to be clear. A ver, a nuestro a nuestro entender, la diferencia nace de la voluntad política de un gobierno capaz de imaginar e implementar exitosamente, esa es la clave, exitosamente soluciones alternativas al mercado. Si nosotros hubiésemos hecho la farmacia, la librería, la universidad y no hubiesen sido capaces de sostenerse, solo hubiésemos aportado argumentos a aquellos que han intentado hacernos creer que solo las soluciones de mercado son las que funcionan. Esa es la clave de lo que nosotros estamos haciendo, sostener en el tiempo con un compromiso fundamental de los recursos que es capaz de movilizar un municipio pobre, hay que decirlo, y sobre todo en alianza con los propios vecinos, con los propios habitantes de la comuna, pues hemos procurado densificar el tejido social organizado, la gente entiende lo que se está haciendo y contamos con ellos nuestro mejor aliado. Y digámoslo, a propósito del estallido social, la rebelión popular, como nosotros preferimos llamarlo, que viene eh, azotando a mi país, ha sido Recoleta una de las comunas que menos ha sufrido ese tipo de episodios y nosotros lo interpretamos como la mejor demostración que nuestros vecinos comprenden que estas eh, realizaciones apuntan básicamente a procurar una mejor condición de vida para ellos y es reflejo de aquello que la infraestructura pública no ha sido vandalizada como ha sucedido en casi cualquier otra comuna de Santiago o en casi cualquier otro punto de Chile. And this being one of the most privatized countries in the world under the regime of Pinochet and what's followed. So coming to you in Preston, Freddie, um, what was the challenge you took on and how? Um, so just to introduce myself, uh, I'm a councillor, Freddie Bailey, and I'm a the cabinet member for community wealth building in, in Preston. So obviously my role is uh, the Preston model now, which is it's fantastic to, to know that so many of you will have actually heard about the Preston model. Uh, to give you a bit of background of Preston, it's, it's a city just north of Manchester with a, a population of around uh, 300,000 people. So it's, a, it's very much a, a place where you either live there, you work there, you don't really kind of leave there. You might go on holiday to places, but you don't really move away from Preston. Um, so it all kind of started um, with procurement and obviously working with anchor institutions, obviously like uh, the hospitals, schools, colleges, uh, even the football club as well, and realising that the amount of wealth that they have, even under austerity uh, with the Conservative government, and obviously massive uh, government cuts as obviously previous panels have talked about, we have to use our wealth to try and actually benefit local people. And it's another way of defeating neoliberalism. Uh, and for example, in Preston, we spend, it's worked out as about maybe 700 million pounds of leakage uh, from all the anchor institutions in the public sector. And a lot of that will end up in tax havens. It goes to big multinational corporations and ends up in a tax haven. It actually doesn't benefit the people of Preston. So what we wanted to do then is break down those contracts to ensure that small and medium-sized businesses within Preston and the wider Preston areas can then apply for those contracts. And it's also about then ensuring that anchor institutions use companies that say pay the living wage, they pay their workers a good salary, they also recognise the trade union. And then through that we started to see an increase in uh, wages in Preston, we started to see a better standard of living. And obviously when more people have more money in their pockets, hopefully they will reinvest it back in the city. And wage levels are increasing faster in Preston uh, compared to the North West and the UK average. And it is proven it's working. And at the end of the day, it means that we are stopping that wealth leakage and working with CLES, which is a, a think and do um, a think tank. Uh, we, are, uh, we really are sort of progressing in this and we're really starting to, to actually benefit the people that put me in power. And we're really starting to represent ordinary people in Preston. How did you figure out how much money was in Preston? And when you say leaking, you mean and how much was going out to companies that were taking it elsewhere? Yes, so, so Claire's did a lot of that work. What's the Center for Local Economic Strategies? Yes, correct, yeah. Um, but it's, it's even simple things like uh, the NHS, which obviously is our national health service, which is uh, one of the proudest sort of socialist things we have uh, in our country, which we are, we are, we'll continue to, to promote. Um, if they want to say procure cleaning products, they just go to the same big multinational corporations that 
procure to every single hospital. And what we're trying to encourage them to do is use local suppliers. And actually, even the NHS is set up in Preston to protect our residents and ensure that they have the best health possible. It's always there when they need it. There's another way that they can they can help our residents, and that's by trying to increase employment and actually trying to have that um, sort of moral conscious to, to really actually benefit the community. Perfect. Asma, to you. Tell us a little bit about what's going on in Islington and how you're helping to build a, a stronger local economy with real worker rights. Thank you. Um, I'm the Cabinet Member for Inclusive Economy and Jobs in Islington. Islington is an inner London borough right next door to Hackney, where Phil is the Mayor of, and a lot of the issues that we face, Hackney faces also. The key issue for us is an unequal, unfair and an extractive economy. Uh, at the heart of the problem and the challenges that we face is inequality. Uh, we have some of the wealthiest people in the country live in our borough, but we have the third highest rate of child poverty in London. You can stand on the corner of one street and see councils, public housing council estates. Just turn your neck and you've got the high growth tech city um, cluster of um, glass uh, skyscrapers. We find that there's very little interaction between the two spaces. That is our challenge. So what we have done very quickly um, is that we're attempting to shape a more democratic and inclusive and fairer economy along a range of measures. I'm just going to focus very quickly on planning because it is about space. Who is the city for? Gentrification is a major challenge for us. We're using our planning powers to force developers to provide 50% social, genuinely social housing when they... Uh, are building private housing blocks. We've had to fight for that very hard. Sometimes they take us to court. We were taken to court a year and a half ago and we won, and we won the case to make sure that a developer. What that case did, because it's now case law and uh, the, national, um, the National Royal Chartered Surveyors had to change the guidelines, in the next development, we were able to force down the price that a developer was going to buy some land on to build um, housing. And by forcing down the price, we were able to secure 60% social housing um, on that site. Um, we are also div um, securing a genuinely affordable workspaces from developers. If they want to build office blocks in our borough over a certain uh, square footage, they have to give us um, a certain percentage of peppercorn rent, which is free office space. What we do, we pass on that free office space to an affordable workspace provider for social value. Social value is you give jobs and training to local people. Um, if, you, if you're a tech company, we want you to do tech for good. We're not interested in just supporting tech for the sake of it. It's very disruptive sometimes. Um, and we're supporting cooperatives in those spaces as well. And we're also purchasing long leases because it is about the space in the city. You have to, the local authority, municipalities, have to try to take back control of geographical spaces in your city. And we're trying to find different ways of doing that. So currently we've just uh, piloted uh, purchasing long leases on commercial, um, we've bought a shop, that's the first time for us, and we've bought some um, write out, some office space as well. And we would hope to, continue to do more of that because if you want to for the city to remain affordable so people can still afford to live there they still have the right to the city you have to be able to provide spaces that are affordable for them mm -hmm. to elaborate you said that you were able to force down the price of land to hold it down can you explain how you were able to do that and what happened through the courts? so uh, local authorities in the uk uh, we at a local level uh, give planning permission for any new developments. So a developer has to come to our planning committee, which is made up of elected members. We have a planning policy, which has to be compliant with regional and national planning policy as well. Our planning policy was is that if you built over 10 units of housing, you had to provide 50% social housing. A, a developer came to our planning committee and gave us 5%. We said no. Give, we, our policy is you give us 50, so we rejected. They came back 18 months later, they gave us 15%. We said, no, our policy is 50%, go back. They appealed to government. Government backed us up at the time. 
the developer took us to the High Court. And it's weird that they took us and the Secretary of State, which is a conservative in this conservative government, to the High Court. And the High Court found in our favour. And what the, what the judge said was, first, you knew that, that the housing, uh, the planning policy was 50%. So you can't, what the developer does is that they claim that it's not financially viable for them to produce 50% social housing. They said, we paid so much for the price of land, so therefore we can't. The judge said, you knew what the planning policy was. Why did you overpay for the price of land? That's the key point. So what we then did for a new site, it's the Holloway Prison site, we uh, produced a, a planning guidance, made the whole world know very clearly, this is our planning policy, this is what we would expect. If you want to get this through the committee, we want you to do this, this, this and this. What that successfully managed to do in addition to the court case, because the judge said the local authority's policy was 50%, is that we managed to, I think the, it was a Ministry of Justice owned the, uh, land, they wanted 200 million, we managed to get the price down to 75, 78 million. I am claiming credit, we are claiming credit, obviously it's more complex. But we have. Thank you. Rodrigo, can you put your headphones on your ears or bring the volume down just slightly so that we don't hear it on the recording? Thank you. Um, you've heard some extraordinary stories, and I, I bet one of the questions in your mind is the question is in mine, which is how do these cities pay for this stuff? It all sounds great. And um, we got a little sense of where Preston looked for uh, money. Um, and in the US, we have some similar models. Um, some folks are here from the Democracy Collaborative that's also participated in the Preston model. Um, and looking at anchor institutions, meaning the most significant uh, money spenders in your community is one way to find some resources. But in the time of austerity, when we think um, cities have been very hard up, where do you find the resources for a, a, a public uh, farm? or for a, a municipal university. Start with Gilles. Alors effectivement, les, les finances publiques sont, sont compliquées. Anne-Sophie l'a évoqué tout à l'heure. Le, les, les, les financements, euh, la, la participation de l'État aux financements municipaux euh, sont en train de disparaître en, en France. Euh, Nous, nous avons, au niveau de l'alimentation, nous avons relevé le, le défi de passer au 100% bio et de créer la ferme municipale à budget constant. C'est-à-dire qu'il euh, ne coûte pas plus cher aujourd'hui de faire un repas 100% bio que lorsqu'on faisait un repas avec seulement 20% de bio, puisque nous sommes allés chercher euh, des économies dans une diminution de 80% des restes alimentaires, par exemple, puisque, faut savoir que En France, mais dans le monde, en fait, c'est un, un pourcentage qu'on qu trouve partout. Un tiers de la production alimentaire est gaspillée et finie à la poubelle. Donc on voit le gâchis euh, financier, écologique, humain, parce qu'il y a des gens qui ont travaillé à, à produire cette alimentation. Donc ça, c'est le, le premier vecteur de, de maîtrise des finances d'un repas de qualité. Le deuxième vecteur, c'est la diversification des protéines. On sait que euh, la viande est l'aliment qui coûte le plus cher, et notamment en agriculture biologique. Et, euh, et donc on n'en sert plus que deux fois par semaine, deux repas sur cinq ont de la viande, des autres sont à, à base d'œufs ou de, de protéines végétales et une fois du poisson. Et, et là, on fait aussi des économies, et en plus, manger moins de viande, on sait que c'est meilleur pour le climat et que c'est meilleur pour la santé. Donc c'est un, un challenge gagnant-gagnant. Rodrigo, where does the money come from for the, the university El financiamiento de la Universidad Abierta Recoleta proviene en su mayoría hasta ahora del de presupuesto municipal. Presupuesto que a su vez en un reglón superior depende de un financiamiento del Estado central, pero que es un financiamiento que en buena medida reproduce las desigualdades que existen en un país que ha segregado la pobreza y la riqueza. Con esto quiero decir que en Chile existen comunas ricas que reciben más dinero y comunas pobres que reciben menos dinero. Es muy paradójico, pero es así. En concreto, nuestro, eh, nuestro factor principal de financiamiento 
es la voluntariedad del de cuerpo docente que imparte clases en la Universidad Abierta Recoleta. Y un segundo factor que contribuye poderosamente a poder hacer funcionar esta universidad con muy pocos recursos es la utilización de la infraestructura escolar que administra el municipio con posterioridad al funcionamiento de la jornada escolar. Es lo que nuestro alcalde, que es arquitecto, llama promiscuidad funcional. Es decir, ocupamos todos los espacios públicos eh, optimizando su utilización y por lo tanto son nuestras escuelas donde funciona la universidad abierta en, en horario vespertino. Es decir, en la tarde y noche nuestras clases presenciales se realizan en las escuelas y de este modo optimizamos en los recursos escasos con que cuenta el municipio. Mm. Similarly to other local authorities, we have had a 70% reduction in our grant um, as a local authority, so we're having to be quite creative in how we find money. We're trying to, what we have to, we bid for, for funding pots, so the Mayor of London, we, were, we managed to purchase our office space and the retail space. We bid for something called the Good Growth Fund from the Mayor of London, he has some money. We're going to, we've got people from Unit 38 over there, hopefully we're going to manage to get some money to invest in our street market, chapel market as well. Um, we also use, uh, through developer agreements, we negotiate something called Section 106. A developer has to give back community gain. And on the whole, the community gain is the 50% social housing, and it is uh, affordable housing. In some very rare cases, uh, if they can't deliver it for whatever reason, and we decide actually we'll take cash, we will take cash. And what we have done is use some of that cash to invest in um, affordable workspaces. And I think that's what we'll do in the future. But that's not our core grant that is for social care, looking after older people, our schools, um, etc. Thank you. Freddie, in, in Preston, I know a little bit about it because we did a segment about, a, a feature about Preston on the Laura Flanders Show, which you can all check out on our YouTube channel if you want. Um, but one of the challenges that Preston faced as it tried to insource, to, to get people to buy locally, procure locally, to cultivate the local democratic economy, was actually not just austerity when it came to money, but the ramifications of decades of neoliberalism that had pulled out not just money, but also skills and talent and people, um, such that in some areas, um, some of our cities are actually not capable of providing all of the services at this moment that we need. How have you addressed that and how do you intend to address that? Where were the major gaps in Preston? Um, so obviously you've heard from uh, some my Labour London colleagues um, and obviously uh, Philip mentioned about being cut by 50% from, from central government and you've mentioned about 70%. We've actually been cut 100% by local government so, so now uh, we don't receive anything from central government. All of our uh, source of income, this is the first financial year it's happened. So all of our money comes from local government taxes, so what we call council tax and business rates. And, and that's what we have to, to deal with. And obviously that's why a lot of people in the north of, of the UK do feel disenfranchised and that's why they do feel like they have been left behind. So with very, very limited resources, we have to try and combat increasing poverty and increasing in the wealth gap within right across the UK. But what we are dealing with and, and how we're trying to combat that is by um, the public sector coming together and really using the wealth that we have left to really try and benefit local people. And, uh, and obviously the, the question I'd always say is with a, a Jeremy Corbyn-led government, um, which hopefully will, will happen on the 12th of December, what could potentially be off Preston? Where could we be in 10 years time if that was elected? And obviously our spending powers will increase and therefore the people that I represent, my friends, my family, and also the residents of Preston will massively benefit because we'll have a lot more spending power to actually then benefit our cities. Um, so it is, it's a really difficult situation we are in, but it proves that our results, we are getting results, as, as I mentioned about uh, wage levels, etc. But we, we are, it's a, it is a, a losing battle because obviously our resources are ever, ever dwindling and, uh, and we do need the extra support, but by working with other public sectors, uh, we are 
really trying to, to benefit our community. Yeah, and in terms of austerity in, in people and, and talent and skills and training, where did you find that you were able to fill your needs locally and where did you notice you had um, gaps? Um, I think I think there are gaps in, in every economy and I think uh, Preston has kind of been left behind. There are some, some heavy industry and heavy manufacturing and we do produce a, a lot of weapons uh, that then sell to Saudi Arabia. So there are a number of... Is that part of your ongoing model? It's, that's, that's not part of our ongoing model. Well, if anything, it should be part of the Preston model because the UK actually buys planes from America, but then we produce our own planes, but then sell them to Saudi Arabia, who then, I don't want to go into the details, but obviously everyone kind of understands what happens over there. But, um, but those skills that we have, they could be used in all sorts of things. It could be used to, to power the sort of green industrial revolution. But in terms of Preston, the willpower is there. Um, to work together and it, businesses are realising, even though they might not be sort of left-wing businesses, they're realising actually if I invest within my local community and I start giving more powers to the people of Preston, then we're going to see a bigger return within our money that we put in and hopefully it is creating that positive economy and actually all um, sort of people from Preston, whether they're on the left or the right, are realising our model is working and they actually are getting involved, which is actually then upgrading mm. and upskilling uh, the people of Preston. Beautiful. Rodrigo, we've heard a little bit about the municipal, the local university. What about the um, popular, the public pharmacy uh, in Chile and, and the impact on, on public health? Partamos señalando que Chile es uno de los consumidores principales en el mundo de fármacos, entre otras cosas porque presenta altos niveles de problemas de salud mental. Y como tantos otros sectores de la economía, presenta una concentración altísima. Debe haber tres, cuatro cadenas de farmacias que eh, son mucho más numerosas que las librerías. En Chile eh, hay un total de 350 comunas y en 280 no existe una sola librería. Eh, eso es súper interesante porque demuestra de que la pretendida efectividad de la solución en el mercado no es tal. Pero volviendo a tu pregunta... La farmacia popular que nació hace aproximadamente hace cuatro años en Recoleta ya ha sido eh, imitada por otras 170 comunas en el país eh, y ha dado origen a la constitución de la Asociación Chilena de Farmacias Populares. Eh, yo decía hace un momento de que la clave para entender el éxito del gobierno comunista de la comuna Recoleta que ha hecho que su alcalde hoy día figure como uno de los principales eh, políticos con futuro a nivel presidencial es la efectividad de estas innovaciones. Esa efectividad es la que explica que se ha imitado, aunque hay que decir que esa imitación también proviene de sectores de la extrema derecha, como otros de los candidatos a presidente, pero que lo hacen llegando a acuerdos eh, con esas cadenas monopólicas de farmacia. En el caso nuestro es distinto porque lo que procuramos es bajar los precios negociando directamente con los proveedores y a través básicamente de un organismo público que regula la adquisición de fármacos para la salud pública. Dando un paso más allá, esta asociación de farmacias populares ahora se apresta a importar de forma directa a proveedores de distintos países del mundo fármacos en aquellas eh, presentaciones que son más consumidas por la población. Este nuevo paso, eh, calculamos, va a significar un nuevo ahorro porque eh, para ponerlo en cifras, eh, el precio de los fármacos en las farmacias populares puede ser hasta un 80% más barato que las que se consiguen en, los, en las farmacias comerciales. No hay estudios aún que eh, pudiesen rastrear a nivel de la salud puntualmente, porque es una iniciativa nueva que se está diseminando rápidamente, pero es nueva aún, eh, que dé cuenta del impacto en la salud. Lo que sí sabemos es que hay una dimensión económica que impacta favorablemente en la población que consume sus eh, remedios, que compra sus remedios en estos establecimientos, porque ya les digo, eh, a nivel de las pensiones, de los sueldos, Chile eh, presenta una situación muy deprimente y siendo una población consumidora de fármacos es un ítem que impacta fuertemente en el presupuesto familiar. Desde ese punto de vista, en la dimensión económica, no tenemos la menor duda 
y eso explica cuántos municipios la están imitando como política pública, eh, es una iniciativa absolutamente beneficiosa para la población. Beautiful. So, both provide the medicines and try to improve the conditions that perhaps would relieve some people of having to take so many medicines. Um, all right, so it's 11 o'clock. Our panel continues for another 25 minutes. I want to give everyone just a moment to kind of recheck in. We are really happy that you're here. If you just arrived, please sit down. Please join us. Sol et al, will you join us at the, at the, in the seats? Um, but anybody that came in recently, do feel free to take a seat. There are a few up at the front. Uh, this is the moment where we need to remember we want to give just as great attention to this panel as the last one. We have David Harvey coming. We are in that morning kind of tea break moment. Don't take a tea break right now. Um, we've got some really extraordinary discussions and models here that, to my mind, are both mind-blowingly original um, and creative and have enormous potential but also, with all due respect, are fragile. These initiatives need the national and translocal collaboration and connection that the last group talked about. This event is all about cultivating that connection, forging alliances, and that's really how I would like to, to continue this conversation now. <coughs> Again, I'd like you each to talk a little bit about what are the challenges in the U.S., often when localities try to start their own insourcing and start prioritizing buying locally and selling locally, even in New York City as we try to gain more urban land for farming, we have multinational corporations that come in and say, we don't want to be discriminated against, and you may not discriminate against us under law. And in New York, we have multinational corporations that want to say that their products are locally grown, and they want equal access to our urban farming land alongside the competitors who are small local cooperatives, um, usually in lower income communities. So these challenges are very real. I'd love to know if you're up against any of the same. Um, and to talk a little bit about what help you need to take this work to the next level. So, um, Gilles, let's start with you. Have you had any agribusiness companies come in to say, you are discriminating against us. And if so, how do you deal with that? Oui, on, on constate en, en France et dans, dans beaucoup de pays européens la volonté de, de l'industrie agroalimentaire et des euh, restaurations privées de, de restauration collective de prendre le, une part de plus en plus importante de, de, part, euh, de part du marché. Euh, nous, on travaille avec, avec un universitaire qui, qui nous aide à conceptualiser ce, 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 cette difficulté et, et on pense qu'il euh, devrait exister dans les échanges économiques une exception alimentaire. C'est-à-dire que l'alimentation n'est pas une marchandise comme les autres. Ce, ce n'est pas un stylo, ce n'est pas une voiture, une chaise. Non, l'alimentation est une nécessité à notre vie, à notre santé quotidienne. Tout le monde a le droit de s'alimenter correctement. Et on pense que euh, toute la production alimentaire devrait plutôt relever de l'Organisation des Nations Unies que de l'Organisation Mondiale du, du Commerce. Et euh, on, Monsarto est chef de file d'un réseau européen euh, urbain qui s'appelle euh, Biocantins. On travaille avec six autres villes européennes. Et euh, on a prévu d'aller au mois de juin au Parlement européen revendiquer une exception alimentaire dans le Code des marchés publics. C'est-à-dire que... Euh, on voudrait qu'on euh, puisse acheter de l'alimentation locale directement de gré à gré auprès des producteurs locaux qui produisent de manière qualitative et qu'on ne soit pas obligé de faire un appel d'offres européen euh, pour s'approvisionner en, en alimentation. Donc le 11 juin, et si des villes, des villes présentes ici veulent s'associer à cet appel que nous lancerons au Parlement le 11 juin, euh, au Parlement de, on aura un, une salle dans au sein du Parlement européen, pour lancer cet appel, pour, euh, parce qu'il y a une vraie inéquité. Il faut savoir que les sociétés euh, privées de restauration euh, collective, qui ont obtenu un marché par délégation de services publics, lorsqu'elles achètent leur alimentation, elles sont libres. Elles peuvent acheter à qui elles veulent, elles peuvent négocier avec qui elles veulent. Nous, ville, quand on a un service public de restauration, ne serait-ce que pour acheter les carottes du champ voisin, on doit faire un marché public 
Et en fait, l'agriculteur ne répond pas. Donc il y a une vraie inéquité euh, d'approvisionnement euh, local et on veut faire sauter ce verrou euh, européen par l'exception alimentaire. Hmm. So did everybody get that in June at the European Parliament there will be a discussion of this question of the injustice in the fact that private companies can buy from whoever they like but cities have to send out every purchase to international tender for corporations of every kind to bid on those purchasing uh, contracts. So if you are going to be at the European Parliament in June, it sounds like there will be a room where you can participate in this discussion. How many of you might be at the European Parliament in June or have people that might be going there? A good number. So and not only sign the petition for Renata in the back, but also meet up with Gilles about this discussion, which could change the law European-wide. To you, Asma, what are you up against and what do you need? So just to stick to the planning issue, um, and it's a battle again with the developer, and it's around uh, protecting light industrial space. Um, many cities have lost their light industrial space. Does everybody, got, does light industrial translate from... You know, workshops. Spaces small, small where, industry. spaces where, uh, if you've got a business, you need to be able to drive a van up to offload, onload things. It's not just an office where you take a laptop and sit down, um, that kind of thing. And it's really, why is that important? It's really important for a diverse economy. It's really important for a diverse labour market because in London you have a labour market that's hollowed out. You've got lots of very low skilled jobs and then lots of very high skilled jobs. And what we're worried about is in-work poverty, uh, the gig economy, um, there's a lack of in-work progression. We think it's part of our job as a council to try and help shape a labour market or protect certain sectors that will support middle-range jobs. And those will be in some of your uh, light, light industrial sectors or sectors, even creative production, photographic studios, they need certain types of specifications. If you want to make a film, um, cre creative production industries as well need that. So we have a developer that wants to force us to allow it to change light industrial into office, grade A office space. We have rejected their planning application twice. They have massively lobbied. They've got connections with the music industry. We get massively lobbied by everybody and we get lobbied even by senior national labour politicians as well and we're a labour council. And we have, we, we have knocked it back a few times. And so the battle that we have is that we don't have enough power to stop that developer carrying on, carrying on, carrying on. And we, they took us to appeal and we won the appeal but just, just very closely. So that's our major challenge. We're trying to protect these spaces in our city so that we can still have affordable space. The difference in, the reason why is that the developer will get far more profit from an office development because the square footage for an office development is in the region of 40, 50 pounds per square foot. Whereas if you're light industrial, you're in the region of the low 20s. That's, so it is the profit motive that is driving developers again. And we're trying to say we need affordable places in the city for different businesses to work and function. I would love that local authorities had stronger planning powers, that the planning, um, planning legislation wasn't so much in favour of developers. The system at the moment is in favour of developers and local authorities need more power to try to stop that. I would love it if we could have collaboration across cities and across countries because, as I said this morning to some people, the same developers that are prop co cropping up in London, in my patch, in Phil's patch, are cop cropping up in Amsterdam and in Barcelona and in other cities. And it requires a concerted um, effort. Um, and yes, lo lo lobbying the European Union don't know what that means for the UK, but still I think there, there's an issue there for uh, cities to come together to uh, combat this the behaviour of developers and landowners. Mm. Freddie, what about you? What are you, what are your, what are you up against? Um, so we, we obviously do have opposition within sort of the Conservative Party within Preston, but it's, it's quite a simple argument to defeat because they just think that, um, that the Preston model is just about simple procurement. And going to a British sort of phrase of saying you're robbing Peter to pay Paul, if we just focus on, say, just procuring local, in theory, other businesses who um, outside of Preston will lose out.
but it's a lot more than that. It's not just about local procurement. It's about the sort of social side of that. And yes, it might cost us as a local authority more money to say procure to a certain company, but if they then pay the real living wage, if they recognise a trade union, if they say bring on a certain amount of apprenticeships, then that will benefit the community. And a, and a good example of this is we're looking to build a, a £40 million cinema complex in the centre of, in the centre of Preston, uh, which will be publicly owned. The council will, will run that. Now, every single private company out there, if they wanted to, could apply for that company, they could apply for that contract. But because we break down that, down that contract, a lot of big private multinational um, contractors don't even bother applying for it because they think, oh, it's not worth it, it's not worth it. What that means is your local electrician can then apply for it. And uh, one large company within Preston that will be sort of building a large part of the cinema, um, the, the social aspect of it is if they're recognising a trade union, um, they're paying their workers a lot higher than the average wage in that particular sector. And what that means is a big developer in London um, will be turned off from applying for the cinema contract because they think, one, it's not worth it, and secondly, they cannot compete with our sort of economy that we set up in Preston because they think, well, actually, we're not going to make as much profit on it, and therefore, we are actually benefiting our city. Mm. Are the unions on your side? What role are they playing? Uh, so the unions are, are, of course, on our side because, obviously, it's benefiting their members. If they're getting uh, more better pay, better working conditions, better health and safety rights, um, and then also it's encouraging employment within Preston, and also by... Uh, Procuring to companies that recognise trade unions, it, it's only it's only a good thing, and obviously the trade unions obviously really, really support that idea. I would like to ask everybody on the panel about the social questions. You asked about the, you talked about society and the culture. Um, sometimes localism gets confused with nativism. We're only going to support our own. How do you handle that? In a society, all of our societies that are very mobile and have many migrants, who gets to be part of that local we? Asma? Um, that's a good question. Um, Islington is very diverse. So we, I think we're close to 50% um, black and minority ethnic community. My ward, my ward is well over 50%, very large Somali community, East African community, North African. Bangladeshi community, and they're all local people. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that because for us, you are Islingtonians. Um, so, I think the key thing for us, um, in terms of when we talk about local, we're talking about local residents, and so that is about how the current models of inward investment, economic growth, aren't delivering for the people that live in a locality, and you could be anybody of any nationality, any ethnicity, you, you belong to our area because you live there, it's fine. Um, but the, the, the issue that we have is that we have a model that says that your locality is starting from one of a deficit. You're not good enough. We say, no, that's absolute rubbish. What we're trying to say by local people is that saying that we've got wealth here already, we've got talent here already, and so we should be trying to build models of economic uh, development, of growth based upon what we have locally. And so when I told you that we purchased this retail shop, we did that because lots of local Somali women were coming to me and saying, can I get some money to buy sewing machines? Because there's lots of women that want to learn skills in the fashion garment sector. And we've got a street in Finsbury Park, which is fashion retail. And we said, yes. So with those Somali women, we're supporting them, many who don't enter into the labour market. This is a really safe way for them to enter into the labour market, but still looking after their families, um, to say we're going to provide you training and employment, and also if you wanted to set up your own businesses, sell them out of this shop. So it's about having that economic uh, growth. It's, from, it's, from, it's the bottom-up approach, mm. and they're very much particip participating in those projects. Gilles, to you, some small French towns are very fiercely proud of their local, very local tradition and not necessarily so comfortable with newcomers. Alors, je voudrais faire euh, une réponse à, à, à deux niveaux, au niveau de l'offre et de la demande alimentaire. Au, au niveau de, de la demande, donc, euh, notre projet alimentaire, c'est de permettre à l'ensemble de la population, quels que soient ses revenus, d'avoir accès à une alimentation qui respecte la santé et l'environnement. Et donc on a des actions 
euh, de solidarité, de soutien, de facilité d'accès euh, des personnes avec le moins de revenus pour se nourrir aussi euh, avec une alimentation durable euh, et, et biologique. Et notamment, on a une tarification sociale sur, sur la restauration scolaire. Quand, quant à l'offre, effectivement, euh, il ne s'agit pas, euh, quand je dis qu'il faut s'approvisionner localement, il ne s'agit pas de se refermer sur nos propres euh, territoires. D'ailleurs, Montsartou, qui, qui est une commune de 1350 hectares, aurait besoin de 40 000 hectares pour se nourrir. Donc on voit bien qu'on ne peut pas vivre seul, <coughs> pardon, et qu'il faut vivre en, en solidarité avec d'autres territoires. Et c'est pour ça que, euh, de la notion d'autosuffisance alimentaire, on, est, on en est arrivé à parler plutôt de souveraineté alimentaire. C'est-à-dire de décider, <coughs> pardon, de décider ce qu'on veut manger, et d'où est-ce qu'on accepte que vienne la nourriture selon la catégorie de, de nourriture C'est-à-dire qu'il y a des choses qui vont venir de Montsartou, il y a des choses qui vont venir de, dans un rayon de 50 km, d'autres dans un rayon de 200 km. Et par contre, il faut que les échanges économiques qu'on qu va aller acheter plus loin euh, soient conventionnés avec ces territoires pour qu'on ne soit pas là à piller les territoires, mais bien dans la construction d'un projet commun où chacun peut vivre de son travail et vendre l'alimentation au, au juste coût. Parce qu'on voit bien que, euh, c'est pour ça que je disais tout à l'heure que euh, le problème que l'alimentation dans le monde pose le problème de la qualité et du coût. Et on voit bien que nombre d'agriculteurs qui produisent de l'alimentation ne peuvent plus vivre de leur travail. Et c'est pour ça que le, la notion de commerce équitable, mais commerce équitable nord-sud, comme on connaît bien le fair trade, euh, c'est bien connu, mais il faut aussi du commerce équitable plus local qui permette à l'ensemble des producteurs alimentaires de vivre de leur travail et c'est là qu'on peut construire de nouvelles relations économiques dans la production alimentaire. And are all immigrants and travelers welcome within your village to be part of this system, part of this local process? <coughs> oui. Nous, euh, tout le monde est, est bienvenu euh, chez nous et on travaille à, à développer fortement les, les logements sociaux sur, euh, sur notre territoire. Vous savez, ce n'est pas parce que euh, Montsartou est sur la Côte d'Azur, donc dans une région près de Cannes, Nice, effectivement, qui a cette image euh, de lieu très favorisé. Euh, nous avons une, une, une population très plurielle et notamment... Euh, suite à la guerre d'Algérie, nous avons accueilli un, un camp de Harki. C'est ces soldats algériens qui se sont battus pour la France. Et euh, il se trouve qu'un camp a été mis à Montsartou à l'époque. Et nous avons travaillé depuis... Il faut savoir que c'est la même équipe municipale qui est, qui est aux affaires depuis 40 ans. Et euh, depuis 40 ans, nous travaillons à l'intégration euh, de ces personnes pour qu'ils bah, puissent se loger dignement, pour qu'ils puissent travailler alors qu'à beaucoup d'endroits, ils ont été rejetés. Donc, L'humanisme et l'accueil de l'autre est dans l'ADN de, de Montsartou. Et, et juste pour rebondir à, à ce qu'il disait la table ronde, beaucoup de, 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 de villes se sont euh, revendiquées de gauche euh, en s'opposant à la droite. Alors il se trouve que nous, c'est un petit peu particulier. Alors, on est une liste de gauche, euh, on se veut écologiste, humaniste et avec des valeurs sociales. Et nous sommes élus depuis 40 ans par une population de droite. Comme quoi, il y a des gens de droite qui peuvent aussi voter pour des gens qui proposent une politique différente euh, pour peu qu'elle soit construite et au service de, de la population. Et c'est peut-être quelque chose à réfléchir pour que justement on soit tous ensemble et qu'on s'oppose un petit peu moins. Final thought from you, Rodrigo. Final thought. Pueden repetir, por favor. Um, just some final thoughts. As you listen to this, I know that part of your mind must be thinking about what is happening in Chile right now. Talk a little bit about your next steps, your thoughts from today's conversation. La rebelión actualmente en curso en Chile señala el fin de un ciclo político de medio siglo aquel que se inició con el derrocamiento a sangre y fuego del gobierno del presidente Salvador Allende. Eh, y sin ánimo de polemizar, el neoliberalismo nace como teoría en la Escuela de Economía de Chicago, pero se implementa por primera vez en Chile. Lo que sucede ahora en nuestro país es el inicio de un proceso constituyente. En ese proceso constituyente estamos todos llamados 
a pensar el país en que queremos vivir que supere aquellas estructuras de injusticia que dieron origen a esta revuelta. En ese proceso constituyente, lo local también va a ocupar un papel fundamental, porque ya en el último tiempo en Chile existía conciencia que es el nivel local donde se puede abordar más eficientemente un conjunto de problemas que aquejan a la población. Sin embargo, en el ordenamiento jurídico que actualmente rige el funcionamiento de las municipalidades en Chile, presenta una serie de restricciones que les da, que, le, que lo hace un león sin dientes, decimos en Chile, que le quita capacidad de eh, cumplir con su misión en forma más eficiente. Pensemos ustedes que la razón que impidió a nuestro alcalde participar en este encuentro es la realización de una consulta comunal que se va a hacer alrededor en 200 municipios de los 350 que existen en Chile, poco más, 250 el día 15 de diciembre próximo. En esa consulta, que es previa a un plebiscito nacional que está prevista su realización para el mes de abril, se van a consultar a la población una serie de cuestiones, incluida temas de asignación de recursos y otorgamiento de capacidad de decisión política a los municipios. Entendemos, por lo tanto, que el proceso constituyente es el espacio de diálogo, de discusión democrática, donde aquellos gobiernos como el nuestro, que ya desde hace siete años venían construyendo el Chile que hoy día todo el pueblo demanda a nivel nacional, donde vamos a exponer nuestras ideas, donde vamos a demandar nuestras necesidades, a fin de poder seguir cumpliendo la misión que le es propia, sobre todo de cara a los grandes desafíos que enfrentamos. Cambio climático, envejecimiento de la población, los desafíos que eh, presenta el desarrollo tecnológico en general, y son esos ámbitos a los que queremos dar, eh, abordar y dar solución desde el territorio local. En todo ese proceso la Universidad Abierta Recoleta, por cierto, va a jugar un papel fundamental, eh, dada la misión que le es propia, y somos desde ya uno de los actores que está entregando elementos a la población de educación cívica, porque ustedes quizás lo ignoran, pero fue eh, la dictadura la que eliminó del currículum escolar chileno la educación cívica y volvió recién a fines del gobierno, del segundo gobierno de Bachelet, muy tímidamente, pero como todo lo que se hizo en ese gobierno, se dio la paradoja que un gobierno de signo contrario fue el que tenía que implementarlo, y ustedes entenderán, que mucha energía y convicción no la han puesto y ya la rebelión vino a resolver todo porque simplemente puso el país eh, pies arriba y somos ahora nosotros los encargados de visualizar el país que queremos construir. I think that is a final sobering thought for us, Rodrigo. Thank you. What sort of society, what kind of society do we want to live in, and how can we together make it? even against opposition. We have gifts, again, for these panelists from the, Dan, the 99th Fund Amsterdam seeds. So let us thank Asma Sheikh, Gilles Perot, Freddie Bailey, Rodrigo Alcado Alcabar. Thank you, Asma. Thank you, Freddie. Thank you, Rodrigo, and thank you, Gilles. You will find more information about some of these projects on the Laura Flanders Show. I encourage you to check it out at lauraflanders.org. Um, you can find us on our YouTube channel. We've done features on Preston and um, some of the community wealth building initiatives that you've heard about, as well as Barcelona, Mondragon, you name it, we've probably covered it. Um, 